and welcome to ICON 2016, brought to you and powered by Always On Wi-Fi. I'd like to welcome you to the second last uh, panel of the day. Uh, my name's Ray, um, and I'm a comic nerd, basically, by profession. I'm also a lecturer. But um, today we're going to be talking about the current state of comics in South Africa. So it's going to be quite interesting, and hopefully you guys will get quite a lot out of it. So let me uh, introduce my amazing panelists, fellow panelists. So firstly, to my left is Naz. Naz is a really, really cool guy, does a lot of writing, and he works in quite a lot of different projects. Uh, we're going to run through a lot of them just now. And then to the, to the left of Naz is what we like to very affectionately call the godfather of South African comics, otherwise known as Moray Roda. He's an amazing guy, and he's done so much for our industry. Like, this, without him, we wouldn't even have comics in this country, and I'm quite happy to say that. So, Liar. Ah, uh, whatever. I always uh, feel like I coined that Godfather of Comics thing. I think, yeah. thing? I actually think that's good. Oh, good, Yeah, good. as far as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's yeah, so we've got a, quite a lot to talk to you about, uh, about, uh, talk about today, and unfortunately not that much time, so we can't really dawdle. Um, but basically we're going to run firstly through what our comics look like um, in terms of content, in terms of visuals, and that sort of thing. And then we're going to talk about the pulp and, uh, and anthology kind of angle. So it's the, one of the many ways of accessing the industry, in, at least here in South Africa. Next, we'll be talking about writing. And then we'll finish up with some, just some last few points just to, just to see where we can go from there. And of course, we would like to open up the, to uh, questions from the audience, which would be amazing. And thank you all to, for all of you for turning out here. This is great. Um, so without further ado, let's start. Okay, so with presentation one, we're going to be talking about the self-publishing and content generation. So, we'll, uh, so this is where we're going to be talking about Murray's side of, uh, side of things, and he's going to run us through everything that he does. Yeah, um, I actually had a bit of a problem putting this together. Five years ago, it would have taken me half an hour, and it would have been a five-minute show. But there's so much content out there at the mm -hmm. moment that I don't think people are even aware of. Um, the one that you're looking at at the moment is a little five from a bunch of guys in Cape Town. Part of that team is myself. Um, I do some writing on that and occasional color on it as well. And that's also been going for uh, three or four years. Um, the thing that you'll notice with all the stuff that we'll be showing you is basically that there is no more a thing such as a defined South African comic book style. Mm. That idea is something that died a couple of years ago. Everybody's producing their own work. This is um, Gofu by Dion de Lange, um, formerly from Durban, now a Cape Town artist as well. One of those bizarre things. It seems like there's a lot of comic <laughs> books coming from Cape Town. Yeah, and I think that is totally the case, though. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the reason is, but Cape Town always seems to have drawn together this uh, group me, of artists. And uh, I don't know, everyone, all the, the, the huge amount of comics that are coming out of the country are coming out of Cape Town. Yeah. I guess you have to go to Cape Town if you want to keep making comics. Yeah, and to get inspired. <laughs> I have to keep going there, looking at the mountain. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> um, Cotton Star, that's up. A uh, team from down in Cape Town. It's uh, post-apocalyptic, set around the southern seas. Um, it's got a lot of fantasy and South African kind of humor in it. Uh, and it's, it's another one of those comic books where the artists sort of realize after a while they do actually have a fan base and the way to expand that is to find the fan base away from actual events such as this one or from Rage or FanCon or anything like that, Comics Fest, and instead to look at people online. So they've started developing a footprint online with people that are international and getting the old South African humor through that. Yeah. That's another Cape Town artist up there, um, Luis Solisana. I really didn't do it on purpose. It, it is just a thing that is. Um, uh, Luis is also producing fantasy kind of stories. He's got a little bit of a South African flavor to it in terms of using South African characters within his storytelling, but then he goes the complete fantasy route, mm -hmm. um, intergalactic sport, and sort of based on the old striker media kind of idea, but just taking it to the next level and making it a bit more exciting and I think more accessible again internationally. Yeah, and I think, you know, everyone, you mentioned Cotton Star having the kind of like online media model, they're trying to like reach an audience online. Louis' model is like he's trying to get the book out into stores that aren't the stores you normally see them at, so yeah. he's making comics that are designed for, you know, the uh, coffee store yes. market yeah. and getting yeah. them like up on coffee counters, which I think is also a very clever way to approach things. 
Yeah, and surprisingly, the, the whole coffee store model is actually working extremely well. So um, we're starting to see that, um, especially here in Joburg, we've got cafes like Wolves as well that are very supportive of the, the illustration side of things. So sure. it's actually an untapped market that a lot of us haven't really considered, and Luis actually proved that it works. Um, so we're starting to see people, a lot of independent artists, although all of us are independent, um, but they actually reach out and work in very weird fields, but it actually tends to be quite successful. Sure. Mm. Back to you, Mark. Yeah. Um, the one that we're looking at at the moment is the Queasy comic book. I think probably the mm. best known South African comic book, simply oh, yeah. because Leiso Mkhezi is an artist in that markets it to death. Mm. He's, he's, he's all over the place. He's been <laughs> TV on radio. Um, these guys are pushing the comic book more than anything else. He's also involved with the guys that are doing Young Hustler, mm. which instead of being a fantasy kind of story, it's actually very real world. It's based in Johannesburg, it's just a guy trying to um, become an entrepreneur and to change his life uh, by actually going out there and, and, and hustling for it. So it's very much South African. It's very real world feeling to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my question to you, Mauro. So obviously, you members of the audience and our members that are watching the stream, as you can see, the quality of art is phenomenal. It's, there's, there's no shortage of talent in this country. So the, the big question here is that why is it that we don't have more international recognition than we do? So we've got, obviously, artists like Jason Masters that spoke earlier today um, and a couple of others that have made huge success, like Lauren Bierkus um, in teams with Joey, uh, with Joey Hi-Fi and that sort of thing. But why is it that we just nobody really seems to know that we have comics, not even within our own country? Um... There are a bunch of problems. Biggest one of them is probably distribution. Very difficult to get your comic books out there. Um, there's, there's very little support from publishers. I was just saying earlier to somebody, when you talk to a South African publisher about comic books or any kind of book, and you say this is what it, the idea is, the concept, they always ask themselves, how many people will actually buy this book? Which is a valid question, but the question stops at, how many people in South Africa will buy this book? Yeah. And that is not how they should be thinking of it. They mm. should be looking at how can we build a bigger audience. So local publishers don't support it. That's, that's one of the bigger problems that we've got. Mm. Um, and also the kind of markup that the comic, not the comic book stores, but the general bookstores add on is something excessive like that. 45% is a killer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, if we look at the U.S. model, so currently their books sell for about the equivalent of 60, 65 bucks if you go to any local comic store, that's what they cost. But for us, um, because we generally have to print on very small runs and everything, we end up to just make, up, make back our printing costs, have to charge 120 Rand for an equivalent comic. And it does make it very inaccessible. So most people tend to go with the graphic novel routes or, like, like we'll talk about just now, into, in terms of the anthologies. Um, which is actually, it is a viable platform. So it's just, again, it's a matter of marketing. And speaking of marketing and everything, just so that the audience could know, where, is, where do we find South African <coughs> comics? Like, how do you buy South African comics besides coming to events like Icon and, and things like Rage and FanCon? Well, this, like, I think goes back to distribution as well as a problem, right? So yeah. obviously there are a few comic stores in South Africa, but it's... Um, there is no clear, concrete way of distributing the books. So when you go to the US market, you're dealing with Diamond, which is one yeah. distributor that offers one catalog that offers access to all the Marvel books, all the DC books, all the Vertigo stuff, all the Image stuff, the Dark Horse stuff. Um, in South Africa, because we're all self-publishing, yeah. you know, we don't have an equivalent model that someone yeah. can just look at a catalog and go, cool, I want Sector and Little Five and yeah. you know, this. These are selling really well. Um, I also think, though, because we're so used to working within the international market and just like relying on the sales of Spider-Man or X-Men or whatever, we're not, like, even the stores aren't necessarily mining it enough. They aren't looking at like what the audience response is like. Mm. They aren't integrating the local books into their system. And perhaps as local creators, not all local creators are working with the stores to try and integrate into yeah. their distribution model in some way. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a hustle at the moment. Yeah. You, know, you talk about like Hustler, the comic, being about this guy trying to hustle to be successful at business. And a lot yeah. of the time in South Africa, it feels like we have to hustle to kind of get into this like, indie space. Yeah. And everyone is hustling separately, you know, mm. rather than as a cohesive whole. Yeah. Um, the whole cohesive whole thing also doesn't work because you've got people pricing their books differently. And yes. generally speaking, um, 
you're looking at covering your costs, but you're also looking at making a little bit of a profit, and you're looking mm -hmm. at marketing your, your, your actual book. And what that ends up meaning is that you've got to make compromises somewhere along the line. You can't always get that sweet spot with the pricing 100% perfect. Yeah. And then you add in the complication of a bookstore, distributor, all that cost, and then you, you basically lose it. Yeah. Um, immediately, that's, that's where a problem comes in. Yeah, uh, and uh, currently also, the, one of the big issues as well is that uh, uh, just a distinct lack of marketing from the comic artist side of things as well. So yeah. we tend to be very recalcitrant and hesitant to actually do this sort of thing, which is actually strange um, because the most powerful thing to get recognition is to actually make people know that your comics exist. Yeah. That's always one of the biggest problems. Yeah. And, the, and we all try to flog that, and it doesn't really work all that well sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've, we've got a slide up at the moment, which is an actual fact, um, a South African mm. comic book that ran for about a year in the pink pages down in Cape Town um, by Ro Roberto Milan. Um, it's about gay squirrels in the gardens down mm. in Cape Town and um, got enough attention that an animation studio was interested enough to have a look at it. Um, and the slides before this sort of showed what the artwork was and then Obviously, to make it a bit more internationally friendly, they had to adjust a couple of things. They had to change <laughs> the, the look of the show. Mm. Also, the whole thrust moved a little bit away from exactly what it was, and they had to, to sort of figure out how to aim it at an adult market. Um, yeah, I so mean, that's kind of an interesting thing, the whole notion of also being willing to change your ideas though, yeah. like to suit the market. Um, I think a lot of the time, because we're working in this very independent space, a lot of creators get very precious with their work. And of course, I understand that. Like, you know, when I'm sitting at home writing a comic or working on my screenplay or something, it's like, it's mine. And I don't want to get notes on it. And I don't want anyone else's thoughts on it. Yeah. But, you know, I'm working with a film studio now. I'm working with Triggerfish Animation in Cape Town. And it is when a When did that happen? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm working on, on a film with them now. And it's this uh, situation of getting notes back and getting feedback and learning that like, even when a note is frustrating, or even when a note is not the right note, it's worth having that conversation around it, yes. because they have an understanding of how it's going to be distributed, how it's going to be marketed, and those are key concerns in terms of getting the idea and the story out there. Yeah. It's the same thing with the comics as well. Yeah, but I think, I think what happens is, I also happen to be at that Triggerfish Story Lab, but I didn't Crazy. make it all the way through, <laughs> unfortunately. You don't say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What I did learn was the focus that's put on who are you actually talking to when, you, when you're doing your story. You can't lose focus of um, where the whole thing is going to go in the end and just focus on this is the story that I want to tell and blind yourself to certain things. Sometimes it works yeah. if you're young George Lucas and sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> when you're old George Lucas. So it's yeah, like yeah, exactly. yeah, that's an analogy actually. Yeah. yeah, so I think if we move on to our if second it, presentation. Let's have a look at the video of Squares. Yeah, let's play the video. <laughs> Beat root. La la da. I'm dying, Artel. And good morning to you too, Neil. I'm being punished for my terrible breakups. Ooh. Ah! Ooh. Pit and pop. <sighs> Sorry, ball on my throat. Just one. Who's your daddy? Quick, kiss me. He's in love with me, but he doesn't believe in safety words. <laughs> uh, tell me, was he heartbroken? Shattered. <laughs> and now for the final knock at... Death's door. Adios, boys. Ugh. Biceps. Um, juice smoothie, sweetie? I always thought my last meal would have more carbs. They make you fat. Wait. Mm hmm I'm not dying. It's day two of the beat clan. It was just beat pee. <laughs> oh, no. What? Pigeon Papa! What? Come back! Pigeon Papa! Yo, I want to be the pigeon daddy. <laughs> what?
and and to get it there was a process of a year, and it, it involved in, uh, a director, um, a complete new art team to, to to change the artwork up to something that would work better in animation, and I think about three writers or so to actually streamline it for exactly the audience that they're looking at. I think it's uh, they're aiming Adult Swim or one of those. Right, those definitely, channels, yeah. yeah. I mean, just yesterday I was actually doing a panel with uh, Mike Scott, also involved in the Story Lab, and he just went through a similar process with Disney on his short. Yeah. He was doing a short called Brun Bochy, based on comics that he'd done as well, mm -hmm. and it didn't translate for the child, market, yeah. well, particularly for kids, yeah. the international market and for kids, and in terms of what Disney was looking for, because they're mm -hmm. the ones working on the short. Yeah. So he's completely reinvented it as a completely different show now. It's called mm -hmm. The Dog Show with Cat. Yes. Different characters. Similar theme, similar approach, but the style is completely different as well. Mm -hmm. I think it was just about figuring out what that market needed and how his original idea couldn't translate for it. Yeah. No, and actually, interestingly, we've got one of the artists that worked on that series just in the artist alley over there. So it's um, Ryan Van Ryan Van Eck is actually currently working on that. So if you guys want to talk to him, it's right over there, which is cool. Um, so I think if we move on to the next presentation, we're going to show you guys a little bit more about the writing side of things, actually. So Naz is going to run you through it. Oh, wait, uh, no, sorry. It's versus the content, yes. Um, so it, the, so this, is more, this is about the anthology and pulp content that we are currently putting out. Well, when I say we, I mean these two. Um, they're doing an amazing job. Um, if you guys look behind me currently, there's a title called Sector. And I think you guys can tell them a little bit more about how that works and what's, what your goal was and how you decided to actually make the whole thing work. Right. Well, Sector is basically it's an anthology series. So we produce three stories every issue. We produce one issue every two months. It's a 20-page comic. Do I have that right? It's an 18-page yeah, comic, yeah. Um, really, when you get down to yeah. the story pages. And each story gets six pages an issue, which is really, really tight in terms of comics. Your average American comic gets 20 pages of just that one story. Here we are breaking it up into these tiny chunks and still trying to convey as much information as possible. Um, and in terms of the model, we basically have the three separate teams working on stories. Um, I work on a book on a story called Red Air with uh, an artist, Ben Rausch. Uh, Moray works with Daniel Hugo on Uncharted Waters. And then we have two other contributors, uh, Michael Smith and Diogo Yonkers. And they're contributing their story as well. And basically, each of us contributes different aspects to the team and, of course, to the financials as well in terms of creating this book that we put out. We've been putting out for now a year, a year yeah. and a bit. Yeah. Just, just over a year. Um, it's a bi-monthly book. So issue seven is about to come out. That's the next one. We've mostly managed to, to stick to our deadlines. Yeah, they, we've, we've sort of gone over slightly with yeah. a week or something. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to put something like serialized fiction out, again, due to distribution and cost issues. And the idea is to have one issue fund the next one. But what we've found is events like this help. Yes. Because then we are there, and we get to talk to people, and we explain it. Bookstores, not so much because it's on the shelf and somebody gets pointed at the book, but there's no real motivation for them to pick it up, to look at it at all. Um, yeah. I think that's another thing as well. I mean, we've definitely seen a combination of like being at the events allows us to engage with people and explain the idea, but also even just to get people to sign up to a newsletter or to engage with us on social media. It allows us to start telling people like the ongoing journey of not just the stories, but also the journey of the book as a whole and like where we're really aiming to go. And I mean, sitting here at Icon this year, we were at Icon last year when we had issue three out, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, and people were like, wow, you guys got three issues out. And now I'm getting people coming up to me going, you know, the last time I saw you was last Icon. I can't believe, you know, you guys have kept it going. I want to see you, you know, at the next event and get the yeah. next issue and the next issue. Mm. I think that's, that's definitely been vital to our survival as a, as a book. Yeah. Mm. Um, on the writing side, for it, which probably we'll talk about later, it's, it's a kind of a difficult thing because, like Nancy said, six pages. We've got the overall story that you want to do, but you also don't want to have six pages of exposition and explaining each time. So a lot of it's sort of trying to figure out just enough action, just enough um, moving forward on the story in each issue. And at the same time, what we bear in mind is that at the end of the day, each story will be 70 pages or 80 pages or 100 pages yeah. eventually. And it still needs to read as one cohesive story. So that's it's a whole lot of juggling that you have to do. It's a completely different way of writing things um, than what I'm used to, at least. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things, again, we'll touch on it more in writing, but 
planning has been the key for all of us. And like from the word go, like you stress planning. Like yeah. Yeah. if you got 80 pages, what are you going to do with 80 pages? If you got this many issues, what are you going to do with this many issues? And that has helped because I like to meander. Yeah. We're creative people. We love to meander. We love to go, oh, it's... I suddenly have this great idea. I'm just going to follow this thread this way. Mm. But now you, you can, but you still know you have to bring it back on track and head towards that conclusion that you always had in mind. Yeah, yeah. We, we can't really. I don't, I don't believe in meandering. I hate different <laughs> yeah. people do that. Um, you are expecting me to choose you over whatever else it might be, whether it's gaming or whether it's watching an episode of Game of Thrones. Make it worth my time, or yeah. you know, and money. This, this, that, yeah, and money, and yeah. money. <laughs> but sector is cheap, and it's yes, right it up is. there. It's very cheap. Yeah. <laughs> if you're at Icon today, yes, <laughs> yeah. And actually, speaking about the cheap, uh, the cheap side of things, yeah. like not to actually say that it's cheap, but um, the one interesting thing about sector, in case you guys didn't realize, um, by looking at the art behind us, is that it's all done in black and white. Now, it's uh, from conversations that I've had with the, with the team, uh, including Diogo as well is that they decided to actually base the model on the kind of typical thing that you would see in 2000 AD back in the day. I know it's back now, but from yeah. when, when the early 90s when it was in its heyday. Um, and then also when you look at uh, things like the um, Shonen Jump anthologies, so where it's uh, generally done in black and white, um, yeah. so it's c it can be easily and quickly produced. Um, it's not to say that the coloring isn't good because the colors are there, it's just in black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's a really clever format to go because one of the problems our artists uh, have, and like I'm speaking from personal experience, is we spend so much time being anal retentive over our colors, and we spend months and months and months doing one issue, whereas we could actually just let it go, as you guys said, um, and spend more time on telling a quality story with good art and worry about colors later, because you can always do colors afterwards. Um, and that's what special editions are for. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another thing we can actually tell aspiring artists is that you don't have to go for high gloss, super, super, super the, the amazing quality marble level kind of thing yet. Yeah. Rather get your work out there. That's the important thing. And that's what we're struggling with with local arts at the moment is we're not doing enough. Um, I mean, even though there's lots out there, it's just we need to get more people buying it, even if you're just doing it in a zine format. It's yeah. just way to work on it. I think our understanding of format is very important. One of yeah. my favorite comics from the US market is a comic called Casanova, mm. which started at Image as a 16-page book, which again, at the time, comics were 22 pages, so it was much shorter than anything else. Yeah. It aimed to be very dense with its information, tell complete stories in every issue, give you a little bit of interesting backup and uh, information from the writer and the artist about their process. But also the book was done in three colors, black, white, and a bit of green here and yeah. there for like shading. Yeah. They didn't want to do that. They, they made that work for them. They wanted to do interesting color washes and interesting mm. color choices. The book existed for a while, existed as, in a kind of a seasonal model, did mm. seven issues, but told a complete story in its seven issues, still implying that there could be more, but mm. just wrapping things up neatly. When there was a volume two, they suddenly started doing color, yeah. and then they re-released the first issues, and they released them all with the color scheme and the new back matter and the new information. Yeah. I think understanding that, like, you don't have to start, like you said, with a Marvel product, a DC product. Those yeah. guys are operating on huge budgets. With lots of time. And with lots of time. And they have a certain standard they like to keep up to that they've been working on for, you know, 40, 50 years. Yeah. Um, we just need to understand that it's about us learning as creators to make work and make yeah. work well and effectively and get the work out there. And eventually, there'll be a market for yeah. the book the way you wanted to do it. Yeah. Do that collected edition with the full color. Mm. You know, spend a year on that. It's, it's always just looking at different formats. That's the bottom line solution of anybody wanting to do a comic book. Um, also, the other piece of advice that I could give them is maybe just start off with a six-page story and see if you can if you can work in a beginning, a middle, and an end into that. Yeah. Because I've read South African comic books that took 200 pages to tell a story that I could tell in 12 pages. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not just me, but. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, think, sure. I think a lot of other local people could, could actually condense all the information down mm. um, and not meander all over the place. Well, yeah. I think as much as I say I like to meander, like, I think I also have an understanding of density of storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the luckiest assignments I got in terms of sector was, we're working on sector, my script for my book Red Air is done, but the art's lagging behind because Ben hadn't done a comic before, so he was struggling mm. with comics. And so you know, we have to like, suddenly just get a pinch hitter in and do a six-page story to full issue one Just in place of Red Air. Yeah. So I have, we have one week to produce the entire thing, basically, like seven days max. I have to come with an idea. I have to write the script. It has to be six pages. 
and then we have to get it to an artist who has to be drawing this thing, and it has to be good. It has to be yeah. worth reading, and it has to tell a full story. That was one of the best things I could have done, because yeah. I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to convey a narrative in six pages? <laughs> and I managed to do it, I think, I think successfully. A lot yeah. of people have walked up to me and told me they really enjoy that story. Yeah. No, they don't yeah. even make the connection that it's the same person that writes the rest of the book. Yeah. yeah. They, people love that story. Um, another thing that Naz left out here is that he didn't use any dialogue throughout the whole thing. So all the dialogue was done as symbols. And the illustrator mm. was Carl, uh, Carl Mostert, Mostert yeah. who actually does uh, the artwork five. for The Little Five. Yeah. Yeah, so that was one of those, pull in one of your buddies and just drop what you're just doing and done, please yeah. do us a favor. Yeah, and, You've and got like four days to do this thing, please. Thank you to Carl, you know, like yeah. you pulled it off amazingly. <laughs> like the art's fantastic. Mm. But it's also like, like writing very much is about problem solving and storytelling mm. is about problem solving. Yeah. So that choice to do like uh, no dialogue but use symbols instead comes from going, if I write dialogue in a day, it's going to be really cliche. Yeah. The bad guy's going to be like, we're going to kill you. And the good guy's going to be like, you better not. I'm going to kill you. Um, so, you know, switching it out and going, okay, what if I just put a smiley face where the, the hero is saying yeah. something, you know, a bit and happy. What if I just put like a symbol for, you know, the villain saying, I'm going to kill you. And mm -hmm. it's a symbol of like just a, a head with the eyes crossed out. That stuff conveys the information in a more interesting way. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, the, since we are the, speaking about writing, we might as well move on to the next section. Yeah, so, sure. So, yeah, so we can actually start talking about your thoughts on writing and mm -hmm. how it actually works, what the... What <coughs> where, and how do people actually get into writing comics? Because most people always think about the art and that's the, the glamorous side and making the, the comic where, like, look good and, and telling all that sort of stuff. But yeah. how do you actually write a comic? Uh, and Because uh, you were saying you wrote a six-page narrative. Uh, I don't even know how to do that. Yeah. Like, look at that kind of stuff and go, what? <laughs> so, so, so how do you actually go about doing something like that? Well, I think you know, the first thing is always research. You have to understand the format you're working in. Like we keep talking about format. You have to understand how comics are written. Um, and you have to do that by also looking at comics that you already like. So I mentioned Casanova earlier. That's a prime example of a comic that I love, not be just because of the story, but because I, growing up I always wanted to make comics, but I had a very solid idea of what a comic was. I was like, okay, a comic book is... X-Men issue 575, it's got to be 500 characters having conversations, they kind of all have deep, detailed, rich backstories, but you realize, you know, X-Men 547 came out 40 years after X-Men number one. Yes. There's a journey people have been on, and a certain degree to which we know Wolverine and Cyclops from, you know, osmosis. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you don't want to do that, you want to look at a book that introduces a new character and goes, this is his new character, this is his deal in one page. Um, and so Casanova is this book that's designed around density. Yes. Everything is just like, this is the world, this crazy thing happens, this is the character, but you get a sense of what's happening. It's clearly told. Mm -hmm. So I looked at a book that I really liked, which was that, and went, how do I reverse engineer this comic that works for me to make a comic? How do I write a script from looking at this image? Mm -hmm. And a lot of like learning how to write comics is that. Yes. It's looking at how comics have been, uh, have been laid out, and reverse engineering them. Hmm. There's actually an exercise that Matt Fraction, the writer of Casanova, did in a class once, and I think it really works, which is uh, he gave people an image, and it was two people walking on a beach. <laughs> and he went, write this panel as a script pa flat panel. And people wrote a description of it, and some people wrote long paragraphs, and some people wrote like one sentence, two people walk on a beach. And then he showed them two examples of that same shot written by two different writers. <laughs> From a Punisher comic written by Garth Ennis, the writer of Preacher, yeah. um, and that is Garth Ennis writes, Two guys are walking on a beach, <laughs> the sun setting behind them. Yeah. And then he goes, here's Alan Moore writing that same panel. Um, Alan Moore, the writer of uh, Watchmen, Watchmen and Thief yeah. Vendetta. And that panel's in, I think, uh, From Hell. Mm. And it's two guys walking on a beach. But Alan Moore writes this purple prose about like, the gas lamps turning on in the background <laughs> in the city. Stuff you cannot see. Yeah. Because Alan Moore is famous for being that guy. His artist always highlighting the bits you actually have to draw. <laughs> His scripts are beautiful to read but you don't need them to be that yeah. dense. Yeah. And all Matt Fraction was saying was, he wasn't saying Moore's way is right, or Moore's way is wrong, and you know, Ennis's way is right or wrong. He's saying, there are so many ways to do this. What is the most <coughs> elegant and best way to do it in your voice? Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a key thing of understanding how comics are made. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think we don't do enough. No. Yeah. Like, not at all. We look at it very much from a perspective of, oh, they're like storyboards, or, oh, like, you know, the. I've read a couple of comics, I can kind of figure this out, I'll just write, there'll be six panels on this page just because there'll yes. be six panels on the page. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's important also to set rules for yourself. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't know how many kind of rules you work within with Daniel uh, on uh, Uncharted Waters. Um, 
not not that many. Daniel knows what he's doing. Daniel was <laughs> oh, he's incredible though. Yeah, Daniel's he's been around since 2001 or something <laughs> like that. Uh, back in the days when we were doing the Gubu comic books down in Cape Town, um, and if you look at it, the artwork that he did back then, it still holds up. Um, so with Daniel. I, I tend to do my writing depending on who the actual artist is. Of course. With Daniel, I will say sea battle, and I will leave it at that, and mm. I'll say, okay, these guys win. <laughs> and Daniel will then figure <laughs> out How on the out. ocean what time of the day it is, where the boats are in relation to one another, one boat's coming out of the mist. Um, he'll figure out where the sun would be for all the highlights and for the shadows to be falling, all kinds of details like that. For another artist... I would have to be descriptive. Panel one, yeah. show this boat. Panel two, show the guy yeah. in the crow's nest spotting the other boat, yeah. and so on and so on. So, I think I think you need to adjust your writing for. It. But again, another piece of simple advice for people: have a beginning, have a middle, have an <laughs> end. Yeah. <laughs> we we made a big deal of that with the sector stuff. Yeah. Mm. Um, and again, I'm going to bash South African comic books. There are a lot of comic books where I can't tell where I am. Is it the beginning, is this the middle, or is this the end? Yeah. Because we've been seeing the same thing for the past two years, yeah. basically. It just goes back to even the idea of, of uh, writing for your artist or knowing what your artist is capable of comes down to a certain degree of planning. Yes. Right? So like for Red Air Scripts, for example, I know Ben hasn't drawn a comic before, but I know Ben loves and understands comics as a medium. So I also thought about what does he need to know about the world and the characters before we even write a script? So that when I go, Ben, they go from here to here, he already has an understanding of that that I don't necessarily need to put into that issue script. Yeah. Because I go, this is the world. It's Mars. Okay. Everyone lives in domes. But under those domes, life is pretty much like normal Earth life. It's suburban Earth life. It's banal. It's like really empty and sparse. Mm. But everyone's wearing crazy spacesuits. Yeah. Right? And then he, suddenly he's designing the crazy spacesuit, but also the dome community. Mm. And he looks at a bunch of reference and goes, okay, this is what a suburb looks like. Here's how I'm going to tweak it slightly. And suddenly it becomes this feedback between the two of us yeah. where he knows enough, we've planned out enough that like, we can incorporate random little occurrences here and there, yeah. but mostly we know our world, we know our characters, and now we can just play in it. Yeah. Um, and then when it goes, the, the same thing with kind of having the beginning, the middle, and the end worked out. It's when I say drift off on a tangent, like yeah. maybe I'm being arrogant. I say, like, I think I can get away with it sometimes yeah. because I know <laughs> my beginning, my middle, you'll, and my end. You'll for entire time. sequences. So mm. if for six pages it feels like it's drifting off a little bit, it's because I know what the next six pages are already. Yeah. Because yeah. I already, I've worked it out. I've gone, what are my first 36 pages? What are my next 36 yeah. pages? What, am I, what do I need to achieve by this point? Yeah. Um, one of the important things is definitely collaboration, working with other people. So this might be a good time to put the velocity slides up. Yes, the ones that we actually yeah. didn't put on. Um, didn't can, put you, can you put on the velocity slides for us? Um, um, yeah, because velocity is actually quite an interesting project because uh, it's with you guys speaking about working with artists. I remember working with you on Darker Forces. Yeah. And the script you gave me was quite hilarious because you actually felt that the page you gave me was actually not the one for me. Yeah. So you gave me a, a completely different one and it ended up working really well um, because yes, we, if, uh, all artists have per different personalities and different ways of drawing as well. Yeah. So, um, and it uh, actually translates really well. Um, and yeah, but Mario will talk more about this. So. That specific script was yeah. really difficult because it was 32 pages, 32 artists. Each artist had to have its, his own page of artwork to do. Yeah, um, the one in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to kind of write the script assuming that not everybody was on the same level of having drawn 20 comic books before, anything mm -hmm. like that. So. We had to balance exactly how much description and how much freedom we, we would be giving people. And, and then also, we were all working concurrently. So there wasn't finish page one, and then mm. page two artists will look at page one and then um, carry on from there. It was we all drawing at the same time because people yeah. draw at different speeds. So there was always that risk of ensure that all the environments look the same. This is the clothing. There had to be a lot planning yeah yes. planning. Lots of planning. planning yeah <laughs> well like this okay. i mean this is something i've also gone through with the triggerfish guys it's like everything is about building a a bible for things, you know world, so yeah. like it's yeah you want your world to be cohesive and coherent if your world is filled with random elements from every different genre you want to know that before you create the world you want to know that before anyone sees the world so that when you go oh yeah you know it's a it's sci-fi mars setting but under the domes everything's suburban and it could look like it's just earth yeah 
if, like, you know, in my comics example, if Ben didn't know that going in, he wouldn't think about it, and suddenly it would feel really jarring, it would feel yeah. really weird and out of place. You want it to feel out of place in the right way. Mm. You want it to feel like a natural, organic progression from one point to the next, even when it's a crazy progression. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, manga, actually, the Japanese tradition yeah. of comics, does that a lot better. Yes. There's a lot more random elements, but a lot of it is really well thought out and well planned, actually. Mm. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because so it, the, a lot of people often think that comic science are an existential thing. So you get a script, you draw the script, so you find a writer, you find an artist, it happens. But it's actually really interesting, you can actually learn a theory behind how comics are constructed as well. So it's like there's ways of telling narrative, the gutters between panels actually do mean something. It's not, they're not just there as a decorative element, there's, it's all sorts of interesting structures too. Um, and that's a lot of th something that a lot of people don't generally consider is that there's, there's so much thought that goes into these kind of projects that you often go, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, that's actually my page on the left there. So <laughs> basically, Mario just gave me free reign to blow people up, which was the best thing ever. Because I like that kind of stuff. And, and he actually happened to cameo in that one. Yeah. Um, so, and <laughs> the way I did that was I just literally did a random bunch of panels. Um, so the, so I, just, I looked at what he'd asked me to do, and I was like, I'm not going to do this as a normal comic. I'm just going to hand paint these each on A4 pages and make it fit. Um, and it actually worked. So it was a really fun project to work on. Yeah. But everything yeah. is done consciously. Yes, it's always conscious. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. that's what makes it work. So you're like, I want to do this random thing that doesn't work with the, form or the traditional format of comics or the style of constructing them. Yeah. But I'm, I know I'm doing that. I know that comics are made this way or could be made this way. Yeah. And I'm making them this way. Oh, very much It's so. a choice. Yeah. And, and just as... A note, in case it wasn't made very obvious, the, the Velocity comic books, um, about 70% of what you're seeing is South African and the other 30% is Australian because yes. that's what Velocity is or was. Um, combination between South African and Australian artists because we wanted to grow that whole idea of um, places that don't actually have uh, local comic books, good distribution, good artwork, good experience in actually producing these things to actually give us space for it by doing something where artists could collaborate with possibly more experienced writers on the whole thing. Yeah, and I think Mari's being very humble because one thing he forgets to mention is that Velocity was the reason South Africa actually featured, uh, featured at the San Diego Comic Con. So yeah. very many, well not very many years ago, it was what, like three years ago? Three years yeah, ago. Yeah, uh, three years ago we actually just happened to, uh, to try, try our luck. We submitted an idea for a panel at the, at the San Diego Comic Con and they said yes. And we had a month to try and figure out how this whole thing was going to work, and we nearly died. But yeah. it was an amazing experience, and the whole premise was the collaborative nature between South Africa and Australia, and how we actually worked with these comics, and made them kind of trans-boundary, trans trans-border, and, and how they actually were still able to tell a really amazing story. And right, from a storytelling perspective, you can't go, we almost died. We almost died. And then go, yes. oh, I'm just going to ignore that point and, like, le and leave you, you hanging. Because now there's suspense. I even want to know how you almost died. Oh, yeah, trying to beg for money on Kickstarter and oh, yeah. just the <laughs> amount of stress and ulcers. But, but also, they almost physically died because... Oh, jeez, um, yes. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the people that know me are laughing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny because you're alive. Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it was kind of amazing because people could look at that artwork and mm -hmm. we could get international professionals to look at our stuff and to tell us what they thought of it and, and they did quite honestly um, there was a lot of things that they liked a lot of things that they felt could do some more with some work yeah. could be done on yeah. which I tend to agree with um, our artwork generally speaking looks brilliant that looks well not all of it but a lot of it does <laughs> but our writing is not on that international level just yet yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, there, there are the exceptions there are a couple of people that are doing great work <laughs> out there like this guy <laughs> I'm okay no not him um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy no 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 uh, yeah, he's average Lauren Beer because let's let's Lauren, Lauren Beer yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. um, because she does books and she does comic books and she loves both yeah. and I think that comes across in the way that she she approaches her work. Um, so I think what we need is more opportunities for South Africans to actually work on that side of things, work on the actual writing of, of what goes into storytelling. But I think it's difficult for somebody to do fiction, novelization, books kind of thing, and then go over to comic books. And it shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, because you should be able to adjust your writing according to 
whether you're doing it for radio or for TV or for movies or whatever it is. Yeah, well, I mean, we've talked about the South African book distribution market or publishers. I guarantee if like Dion Mayo was like going, I want to do a yeah. graphic novel, suddenly yeah. comics would be this huge thing that definitely will sell yes. because he's got a big name and a, yeah. a lot of name recognition here in South Africa mm. um, and to a certain degree internationally as well. Yeah. So I, I think like it's, it's like Lauren's a great example of somebody who succeeded internationally as an author and now makes comics as well, Vertigo. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, it's about getting that exposure. I've seen mm. so many artists. I was... I remember when Jason Masters, before he was drawing like, you know, James Bond or even doing yeah. any international comics, he was just a, a sort of commercial artist. Mm. He had done sequential pages and gotten to a point where he was good enough to do international comics. Yeah. And I remember him bringing his portfolio. And the reason he got to meet, uh, well, there was a comic store who brought, which brought down Ethan Van Scarver, a US yes. comic artist. Yeah. And he got to meet Ethan and went, can you look at my portfolio? Tell can me you give you me think. some notes? Yeah. And Ethan was looking at a bunch of artists' portfolios and giving them crit and going, you know, okay, you could use a little bit of help with your storytelling. Yeah. You could use a little bit of help with your, with your character design, your expression, your acting. Mm. And with Jason, he just opened it and went, oh You're my amazing. gosh, oh my gosh, yeah. you should be drawing comics right now. You should yeah. be drawing comics right now and put him in touch with his editor. So I think we do need that exposure, but we also need to keep practicing and keep refining so that when you yeah. put your portfolio down in front of somebody, like the notes they're giving you can be useful. Mm. Often you can tell when someone's just being a prick or when someone's being supportive, you know, when someone's yeah. giving you real criticism. Yeah. And I think a lot of these people just want to give you real, genuine criticism. This yeah. is where you need help. Oh, and ask for advice. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we are rapidly running out of time. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd actually quickly open up the, the audience for some questions as well. So if anyone is keen, um, please, uh, the mics are going to be passed around. So put your hands up and we'll answer some questions. Pippa, do you have a question? No. Chris, I'm sure you have. Oh, there's one. <laughs> Stan, hold the mic here. Uh, hey, hey, Nas. Nice. Hey, Dan. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to an artist who is scripting and drawing his own book? Well, you two can definitely help, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not an artist. Maury is actually an artist as well. Yes, Maury is an artist. Um, so I think he might have uh, even better fit for you. But I think the key thing is, like, comics ultimately is visual storytelling. To some degree, the artist is the writer sometimes more than the writer is the writer. Mm. I think that um, you know, the, the, writer work, the writer works out perhaps the larger arc of where things are headed, a deeper understanding of the characters. Not to say that the artists can't do this, because mm. they are writer artists, oh, Frank yeah. Miller and uh, many other examples, yeah. obviously. But I think what a writer's role is traditionally is to provide that structure and that framework and that skeleton. If you can build that yourself before getting into the, the illustration and the storytelling, you'll know where you're going. You're looking for a roadmap, and that's what writing is. It provides this roadmap. Yeah. The one thing I often think about with comic scripts is no one is supposed to see a comic script except for an editor, the writer, and the an artist. artist right? yeah. like, and the letterer and like, the production people. Yeah. Like, no one really needs to see one unless you really want to write comics and you want to know how they're made. So you know, you're not writing a novel. Don't try to be fancy, but mm. try to lay out that structure that you need and look at it as a planning document, yeah. something that yeah. everyone needs, whether you're a writer or an artist. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the movie Mulan. I, I take every opportunity that I get to actually mention that to people. Like, okay. Mulan? Mulan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the Disney thing. It's probably my favorite Disney movie. Um, there's a scene in there where they go on about you need to be as, as strong as the mountains mm. and force of a raging river yes. and all that stuff. But the important part is also that, that fluidity. You need to be able to change. So don't write yourself into a box. Yes. When you say this is beginning, middle, and end, you plan it that these are the events that are going to happen. Yeah. But when you are writing it and you find your secondary character becomes more important and it, it, mm. that person becomes more exciting, follow, follow that writing. Yeah. If you are resonating with something else within your script from where you started, chances are people that are reading it are going to feel the same. They don't, don't try to force it back to beginning, middle and end as you had it. You need to give yourself a little bit of leeway. Yeah. Um, I mean, other than that, it's just consistency. Just yeah. try to try to work on it on a consistent basis, because when you, I know this from working on things part time. When you work on it today and you give a two week break and you work on it again, it it breaks your flow really badly. So yeah. if you can, just try to get in a, a regular working habit. Yeah. Definitely. And also be patient. That's the most important thing because you want to draw it now, 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 now. Give yourself some time. I think we've yeah. got time for literally one more question. Uh, here we go. Um, oh, there we go. Hey, guys. 
I just wanted to quickly ask, you guys spoke about um, basically marketing your work because um, you can be like the greatest artist in the world, but if nobody knows it's there, yes. what's kind of the point? And uh, I was just really curious, like, because I've noticed with South African art, um, American comics, they seem to have like whole page adverts like existing no. there. South African art, it seems like we found a lot, a, a much smarter way of adding it in with things like Super Strikers, where apparently mm -hmm. like now they get sponsored by KFC or yeah. whatever. So I was actually quite curious to ask you guys, like what form of marketing have you found to be the most effective? I think you guys mentioned with the writer of Kwesi and the artist of Kwesi, he does tweets and all that, and yeah. he's on television. So uh, yeah, I'm just interested in No, your it's pretty much Facebook is your, is your best friend, yeah. in, at least locally. Most people actually will, be, will be, be more willing, especially younger audiences, are more willing to access something on, some, on a channel like Twitter or Facebook and sometimes things like Snapchat, um, uh, but generally you need to keep to your social networks for now. That's the best starting point, at least. Uh, yeah, I think you have to remember that also, like, in South Africa we're a community as much as any, like, as much as we are creating these sort of products or whatever, there's a sense of, like, this nerd community. It obviously exists in the States as well, but it's a much larger audience that's being yes. marketed to by, again, mega corporations like Marvel or DC. Yeah, they have the money. <laughs> right? So when we're dealing with each other here, I think, the, the thing we still have to get right is the connective tissue between all of us. Yeah. But I think we are. I mean, even this panel is an example of, yeah. you know, you yeah. guys know each other Cape from Velocity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, you're from Cape Town. Like, but we're still working together constantly yeah. to market our work, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me, I, there was a, a brief stage in my life where Media24, um, they, they massive, giant conglomerate, billions of rands, not dollars maybe. <laughs> but um, they, they tried doing comic books and I was part of the studio. In actual fact, all the guys that work on Little Five, that's how we met. Yeah. We, we worked for them. And one of the early decisions that we made, all the other guys came from Striker, they came from Mamba Media or from Gencom. All those are companies that do the product placement kind of thing where they've got the logos on the clothing and, and things like that. So they came from that background and they felt very strongly that we shouldn't be doing our comic books in that way. And I really didn't like the fact that corporate people would interfere with our storytelling. So I also agreed with that. We pushed the book into a direction where the advertising had to be sold as if it was a magazine, um, mm. actual product uh, with its own full page, advertising, Coca-Cola, whatever. And um, looking back at it, that was the arrogance of youth. Yeah. <laughs> we should have followed that model. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that model. Yeah, we must wrap up. Uh, because it's, it's, if you do it properly, if you do it in a smart way, then you will get to pay the bills and yeah. your studio doesn't shut down after two years like ours did. You know, so, yeah. so you've got to be sensible about these things. The social media thing, it's critical. If you want to see people that do it right, uh, the guy that does Madam and Eve, Rico, yeah. artwork Quincy. that he posts, he's, he's constantly posting, he's on there and he's responding and he's also looking at other artists' work and um, supporting their work. John Curtis as well, he's also very busy. These guys are cartoonists, but they, they look at young and upcoming artists and they support them. And because they start that dialogue, it's a conversation. If you're but doing social media easy. stuff, yeah. you can't talk at people. You've got to talk to them, with them. Yeah. With them. Yeah. They, they're part of the conversation. You need to allow them into your space, yeah. into what you're creating, because they'll build your brand a lot better than you could on your own. Yeah, and with that, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. So thank you so much to everyone that's attended our panel. Thank you to Always On as well. For, and, as, and as a special huge thanks to Icon for hosting us in this event. Um, just a reminder, this will be streamed next week as well. Um, so you can find us on the YouTube channel. Um, so there's lots of different opportunities to see, uh, to, to see and engage with us. And you can find all of us online. We're all there. And we're always happy to talk to new artists. So thank Thanks you very much. Us. And thank yeah, you Facebook guys. Us. Yeah, thank Facebook you. us. Yeah. Facebook us. We're all on there. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked this video more than you like chocolate cake, I really suggest you hit the like button down below. And if you want to be kept up, kept up to date with all of South African geek happenings, please subscribe to the Geek XP YouTube channel. We would really appreciate it. And you'll get all the latest happenings in geek culture from around the country. Thanks very much, guys.